Treasure HD's City Guides hits the pavement to seek out distinctive architecture and history in the urban landscape. Local guides share the folklore and highlight the design of buildings to bring neighborhoods to life. From Romanesque revival to modernism, discover the fascinating architecture, old and new, that frames cities all over the world. Today, City Guides heads to the unique and multicultural neighborhood known as the Grange. From one of the oldest surviving estates to the artistic hub of Toronto, the Grange is an eclectic mix of history and architecture, comparable to any painter's palette. Hello, my name is Mary Lee Meyer Balcone, and I'm going to be taking you today through one of my favorite neighborhoods, the Grange. This vibrant community has had numerous waves of immigrants move into the area. It began in the 1890s with British immigrants, followed shortly by Northern and Eastern European immigrants. More recently, there has been an influx from the West Indies, Philippines, and China. The boundaries of this neighborhood are Spadina Avenue to the west, College Street to the north, University Avenue to the east, and Queen Street to the south. We start our tour on Baldwin Street, a small street full of shops and restaurants that reflect some of this multicultural mix. And they are in the category of cheap and cheerful, which is of course appealing to the students who um, go to the Ontario College of Art and Design in the south and for the University of Toronto students in the north. And of course the University of Toronto was built on land that was sold to them by the Bolton family, the people who built the Grange. Darcy Bolton Jr., the Grange's original owner, had taken initiative to purchase land in and around the town of York. The original purchase price was made for pennies an acre and would now be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. From vast fields to a buzzing city core, the Grange has come a long way. In the 1970s, there was a thought that this would be a really good place for 14-story hydro substation. The neighborhood did not agree. And as you see, the neighborhood won, because what there is instead is an award-winning 152-unit Ontario Housing Corporation building, which was designed by Diamond and Myers. Beverly Street in the 1870s was home to three mansions as well as other fine housing. And that's where we're going to go now, on to Beverly Street. Here we are at the Lambton Lodge, which is a home of George Brown. He was the publisher and owner of the Globe newspaper. He was one of the fathers of Confederation and quite a radical thinker. Now, it's often said that he was quite a definite and determined man. Some actually say that he lacked personal charm. And this had a number of consequences. One of the key points in history for George Brown took place in 1872. Printers of his newspaper, along with other print laborers in the province, went on strike with the demand for reduced work hours. Print owners, including George Brown, fought back. And so, in response, many workers took to the street in a show of support for the strike leaders who were jailed. In the end, the march was 10,000 strong and transformed into a labor parade. This is now a familiar tradition, marked in the calendar by Labor Day, a statutory holiday for all. The George Brown House is not just historically significant, but an excellent example of architecture from this era. Built in 1875 by architect William Irving, it is the newest of the three mansions on this walk. Having undergone elaborate restoration and preservation in the 1980s, with the help of the Ontario Heritage Trust, the mansion has been brought back to its former glory. The house is in the Second Empire style, and the Second Empire that it refers to is out of Napoleon III when he was making his, his restoration of Paris. The most distinctive part about the Second Empire has to do with a mansard roof. 
It is said that um, at one time this was um, created as a means of tax avoidance because in France you were taxed um, on the number of stories below the eaves. So if you added the other story up above, that story was tax free. A very nice concept to be sure. The mansard roof is pierced by bonneted dormers which are accented with decorative spindles and keystones. Just beneath the roof lines are modillions. The buff stone acts as a highlight as it outlines the remaining windows and imposing doorway, making them stand out from the red brick background. Inside the George Brown house, the $2 million restoration project reveals the elaborate attention to detail. On the main floor are beautifully appointed rooms, starting with the expansive foyer. There is an Art Nouveau dining room which has mahogany panels and a fireplace made of ebony and marble. The floor is done with inlaid woodwork. The chandelier was reproduced based on a dated photo and hangs in the original spot over the large dining room table. Most impressive is George Brown's old study, restored in great detail. This time capsule is a fitting monument to one of Canada's significant historical figures. The building is now available for conferences, for special events, and also for tour groups. Before we go down Beverly Street, we've just taken a little side trip onto Darcy Street. And Darcy Street was named after Darcy Bolton, the gentleman who built the Grange. And the reason for this little side trip is to look at one reminder of the Jewish presence here in the neighborhood. By the 1900s, this area would have been solidly Jewish. So they established schools and businesses, built their homes, but they also provided themselves with places of worship behind us would have been the house synagogues and the signs on the side of the door note that the Goodman and the Schiffman family provided money so that people from often from the same village um, in Europe would come here meet together and have a place of worship. So from this more modest residential street we'll now proceed on to Beverly and see some of the mansions there. Here we are at the Beverly mansions. When they were built in the 1870s, they would be really quite grand because they had the large gardens as well as being Second Empire style houses. One of the previous owners were Isabel and John King, a family of great political importance. Isabel King was the daughter of William Lyon Mackenzie, who was the first mayor of Toronto, as well as the leader of the famous 1837 rebellion. She was also the mother of William Lyon Mackenzie King, who was thought to have lived here while attending the University of Toronto. He went on to become the longest serving Prime Minister with 21 years in office. There were plans that um, these four houses were going to be torn down and a police station was going to be put up. Again, the neighbourhood expressed its concerns and as you see, they were unsuccessful. Instead, Toronto's non-profit housing organisation renovated these four houses into 58 unit projects. The mansions were built with mansard roofs, but alternated between a convex and concave shape. The dormers are again decorated with keystones in the centre. They present an example of the grandeur created in the French architecture of the Second Empire. Up next, City Guides continues with a very rare glimpse into the dark past of one of the oldest mansions on Beverly Street. City Guide started off with a look at the northern part of the Grange neighborhood and a look inside the historic home of George Brown. Now the walk heads south on Beverly Street. Here at the Italian Consulate, we're at the oldest mansion on Beverly Street. It was built in 1872 by David Roberts, with many additions by the noted um, Toronto architect Eden Smith. The house was built for George Beardmore, a prosperous tanner who named the house after his place of birth, Chudley. The theme of the Second Empire style continues with this structure, but not without some unique distinctions. It is asymmetrical in design. Although currently under renovations, one of the main features is the tower which extends above the roof line. Other typical features include the bonneted dormers with keystones and modillions. Modillions are like decorative brackets that run beneath the eaves. 
the elegant entranceway is framed by two Doric columns. Beyond the doors is an elegant interior, now repurposed as the office of the Italian Consulate in Toronto. Welcome to the Italian Consulate General. We have the privilege to be in a very beautiful Victorian house built in uh, 1872. Now uh, it's uh, the office of uh, the Consulate General. So uh, people, Italian citizens, come here uh, for their passports, for citizenship. We have a very interesting artifact uh, here in the building, uh, some fascist symbols, which uh, recall in a way uh, our dark past, uh, but we, we, we decided not to remove them uh, because it's a piece of history and uh, it's our past. This symbol was uh, used by uh, the fascist regime regime as, uh, as the symbol of uh, the power of the people, uh, the authority of the people, and uh, it originally uh, came from the, uh, the Roman tradition, the Roman Empire. From the dark secrets of the Chudley House basement, the walk heads toward a structure with some redeeming qualities. Here we are at the uh, Chinese Baptist Church, which was originally the Beverly Street Baptist Church. We're at the back of the building because this is actually the oldest part. This was built in 1880 and it was done by Langley and Burke. This building is an excellent example of dichromatic brickwork with the combination of buff and red brick. There are narrow peaks and narrow arch windows. The pale yellow brick acts as if to highlight the architectural features and make them stand out. Below the eaves is brickwork done in a corbel style which is achieved by layering staggered bricks. It has a delicate effect, creating a look very much like drapery. This is the 1880 part, and then of course the church was built in 1886. South of where we're standing now, there is a group of row houses. And at one time, it was thought it would be a good idea to tear these houses down and to build a large apartment block. Yet again, the community rallied together and prevented this from happening. Through the perseverance of the local residents, the characteristic Victorian row homes were preserved. Extra measures were taken to ensure their significance by having plaques placed to commemorate the early tenants of these homes. Some other features of the house that are fairly distinctive is again the use of brick. So we have the buff colored brick and now it's accented with the red brick. And this is fairly distinctive of the city of Toronto and you will notice that it is the Gothic Revival style and that usually when we're talking about that we're talking about the very steep peaked roofs and the pointed gables. Now we're going to leave the row houses, we're going to cross the street and we're going to see the oldest uh, church on our tour which is the Church of St. George the Martyrs just across the way. Here we are at St. George the Martyrs. This is actually the third oldest um, Anglican church in the city. The only older ones are St. James Cathedral and Little Trinity. It also has the second highest church tower in the city, again, St. James being the tallest. It was built in 1844, and it was built on land that was donated by the Bolton family. Um, the church, as you can see, it only has the bell tower left because um, the majority of the church burned in 1955. When the church rebuilt, it decided to leave the original location as a garden. Instead, the church was built in the parish hall. The lovely garden still retains the original footprint of the first church. Visible are the old pillars and there are grills in place along the walls where the stained glass windows would have been. Now we've been talking um, all of this about the Grange, the Grange neighborhood. Now is our opportunity actually to see the Grange itself. And again, I'll mention that it, when the Grange was, um, was built in 1817, the Bolton family would have had 100 acres of land. It would have gone from Bloor Street down to Queen, between um, McCall and Beverly. It is even said by one of the ladies of the town that Mrs. Bolton might as well live in Kingston because she was so far away from the center of the city. Well, we're not far away, so let's go up the street. So we've arrived now at the Grange. This was the home of Darcy Bolton, lawyer, magistrate, and part of the oligarchy of early York. 
Now the style of the house is Georgian. And that means that you're looking at kind of a rectangular box-like structure. And it is one that is very symmetrical. So if you have windows on the bottom, you'll have windows on top, kind of the center hall plan. The bullseye window located above the porch would have been the servants' quarters. Another interesting detail is the front door framed by the Doric columns. There is no latch or handle because the servant would have opened the door and announced the guest. A true grand estate, it was modeled on the aristocratic residential estates of the English countryside. After Darcy Bolton's death, his son William Henry moved in with his wife Harriet Dixon. After William Henry's death in 1874, Harriet was left with the house, but within a year remarried a well-known academic, Goldwyn Smith. Since they were very fond of the arts, they decided to deed the land and house to the Art Museum of Toronto. Upon their death, the Art Museum moved into the Grange and on the second floor until 1913, what we now know as the Ontario College of Art and Design occupied the second floor. The converted space now acts as a member's lounge for the Art Gallery of Ontario. Although some of the first floor has been repurposed, there are still many original features. This includes the main hall with its large 19th century window displaying the Bolton family crest and impressive spiral staircase. Neighboring the Grange was the Ontario College of Art. The building was built by George Reed, the principal of the college, and was designed in a complimentary Georgian style. Now the college expanded quite quickly and so in the 1950s its buildings uh, went on to McCall Street and then after a number of other expansions finally in 2004 the Sharp Centre for Design was opened. It was created by noted British architect Will Alsop and it has added a new dimension to architecture in this part of the city. And so we're going to go visit it but just remember to look up. The Sharp Center is a 60,000 square foot facility that stands nine stories above the main campus of the Ontario College of Art and Design. Its main support is a central column, although the legs are also supports. The legs are 10 stories high and they are hollow. Originally, they were used as gas pipelines, but were given new life as the colorful supports for the center. The bright paint used on the legs was specially chosen because of its ability to expand with heat. So if there is ever a fire, the paint will expand and protect the steel. Coming up, City Guides visits the newest architectural feature to the Grange, the transformation of the Art Gallery of Ontario by Frank Gehry. From the historic residences of the Grange to the humble beginnings of the Art College, City Guides makes its way now to the last stop on this walk. When we look at the new building, the first thing that we see, of course, is this wonderful wood and glass facade. It goes 600 feet along Dundas Street and is 70 feet high. The facade is scaled to respect the neighboring houses on Beverly and Dundas. This is the first Frank Gehry building in Toronto, and it seems appropriate that it should be here because Gehry was born in Toronto and he did live on Beverly Street. Frank Gehry is an internationally acclaimed architect with recognizable projects such as the Guggenheim in Bilbao and the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. He is considered an icon in the world of architecture. It's only fitting that the first Gary building in Toronto is situated in the neighborhood where he was born and raised, the Grange. It is a remarkable transformation of a provincial institution that has brought it well into the 21st century. The renovation and expansion project of the Art Gallery of Ontario was just that. It was a massive renovation and a very large expansion. There were very few parts of the building that were left untouched by the Gary project. We needed wonderful space and increased space for viewing art. That was the primary goal. 
So it's a huge challenge that we gave Frank Gehry when we said, you know, we're not moving uh, and we're not demolishing. We want to expand on the site without increasing our footprint. His response and how he merged the old with the new, I think, is really quite brilliant. I think it centers around how we address Walker Court, the historic heart of our building, weaving uh, circulation elements through and around it. First of all, by putting the entrance um, on line with Walker Court and therefore on line with our historic first home, the Grange, uh, was a brilliant move. It kind of sliced the building in two, creating a kind of symmetry and an ease of navigation for visitors. The Galleria Italia, in which we're currently standing, came into being as a way of linking adjacent galleries, plus solve the problem of how the building was going to address the street. The South Tower is, of course, the largest new build piece of the project. That's a piece that never existed before. And uh, it is clad in titanium, tiled in a kind of um, a brick laying pattern that he favors. It's called earthquake. And titanium has also a lovely light quality about it. It's a relatively thin gauge metal. It's very pliable. Um, and so there's a bit of a pillowing effect in the, each of the tiles on the facade. The curvilinear moments in the building, what they did with all of the circulation elements, the grand feature stair that cuts through the roof of Walker Court and lands at each of the floors of the new South Tower, the serpentine ramp, and even Gallery Italia, which can be considered a bit of a circulation element in the building. They chose Baroque curvilinear moments to have this kind of conversation with the neoclassicism of the rest of the building. The serpentine ramp that navigates the two grades of our hall, it moves you forward, it makes you feel welcome. And then of course you're just kind of sucked in by this extraordinary interior daylight that comes through Walker Court and over that stairwell that greets you as you enter the building. The Art Gallery of Ontario for me is an extraordinary public forum where People can encounter ideas that are important in their own lives in a visual way. A place of debate, it is a place of adventure, it is a place of creativity, it is a place of self-discovery. In our walk today we have seen buildings built between 1817 and 2008. Although the area has changed structurally, it continues to welcome what is new and preserve what is valuable from the past. The Grange neighborhood has proven to be a truly diverse place both culturally and architecturally. From its colorful past, historic landmarks, and a determined residential population, the Grange has not only survived, but flourished. It is an area that continues to pay tribute to its early Victorian heritage and has become Toronto's artistic centre with the Art Gallery of Ontario at its heart.